Welcome to worship this morning. So glad you're here. Let's all stand together. As we sing, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Let's sing. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned How wonderful is our Savior's love. Amen. He's good. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Mount Pisgah. It is wonderful to see you on a Sunday morning here as we get an opportunity to observe the ordinance of baptism again. It's always a great day when we see the baptismal waters stirred. And let me just say this. I make a point to say this every time that we have the ordinance of baptism but I want to ensure that everybody is clear about what today really means for those that have come to be baptized. What they are saying to you today is that they have become a follower of Jesus Christ. There is no saving power in this water. They got saved when they trusted in the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary for their sin debt. And when it was paid, they became a follower of Christ. And now they take a step of obedience. And so today is a picture of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it's also a picture of us and our old man dying to our old self and coming out a new believer in Christ. And so we rejoice with these that have come today. Let me also say for those of you that are guests today, we say thank you so much for being here with us. You can uh, stop by one of our welcome centers 
fill out a connect card. We'd love to have a record of your visit today. We also have a small gift as a token of our appreciation for you being here in the service with us today. So uh, you stop by there. But it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to be a part of a church that gets to see the baptismal water stirred. And so uh, let's observe this ordinance of baptism this morning. We've got three that are coming this morning. First, we've got Camden. Camden Parker. <laughs> and he's excited. So Camden, upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. to see a grandmother and a grandchild baptized on the same day. You see, the blood of Jesus reaches from the young to the prime. Amen? I wasn't going to say old, but that's, I wasn't going to say it. I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> but aren't you thankful for the saving power of Jesus Christ? So, Vanessa, upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in obedience to His command, I baptize thee, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Next, we have Aaron Allen. Got saved just a couple of weeks ago. We praise the Lord for... There's that last step right there. Praise the Lord for her salvation. And so, Aaron, upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in obedience to his command, I baptize thee, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Praise the Lord. Amen, church. Isn't God good? Let's stand to our feet. We're going to have a word of prayer. The band is going to come back, and we're going to celebrate some more through song and it's just wonderful to be in the house of God today. I hope you have come looking for a blessing. Hope you've come prepared to worship. And maybe the cares of life have been a, a real heavy on your heart over these last few days. Why not, during this next couple of songs, prepare your heart to receive the word of God today. And may you be blessed for being here in his house. Join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for what we've already seen this morning. Those that have made their next step of baptism, Lord, in their obedience, in their walk with you. And now, Heavenly Father, as we sing, as we worship, I pray, Heavenly Father, you'd inhabit the praises of your people. Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful day today in God's house. In Jesus' name, amen. His mercy is unfailing His arms a fortress for the weak Let faith arise Let faith arise I lift my hands to believe again You are my rest Pour out my heart these things I remember You are faithful God for 
faithful church. And even in our trouble, even in our trials, we know that you are faithful. You hear the cry of your people. You hear our prayers and you're good. You're so good. the goodness of God. 
this morning are thankful for the goodness of God that came running after you. Amen. The Bible says he came to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, you didn't go looking for him. He came looking for you. And I praise the Lord that he is one that seeks and saves that which is lost. I was one day lost and on my way to hell, but Jesus reached down, saved my wretched soul, set my foot on a solid rock. Amen. And I'm headed to a place called heaven. Thank you so much again for being here this morning. Uh, as you know, over the last uh, several months, really over a year now, we have just allowed the plates to be at the doors, and that seems to be working okay. You just continue to be faithful in your giving, and we want to say thank you for how faithful you have been in your giving of the tithes and the offerings. But uh, I'll tell you to not be weary in well-doing. Just seek the Lord and what He'd have you to give. If you're a guest today, we don't expect you to put anything in the offering plate. We want to give to you today. And as I said in the opening and in the welcome, we have a gift for you at our welcome desks. I was just uh, waiting for us to say thank you for being here with us today. And we hope God will speak to you in a powerful, powerful way this morning. I want to say Miss Ann Rain, he's down here on the front. She went through some surgery, rehab, a lot of difficult days, and she's able to be here this morning. And she just wanted me to be able to say to the church, thank you uh, for praying for her. Thank you for how you have ministered to her in these days. I want to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to sing. And this next song is the blessing. And as we preach from Titus 2 this morning, it really speaks of we want to see our children and our children's children. We want to see them walk the narrow way. And we're going to learn from song and through sermon this morning how that can happen. And I pray that God would speak to you this morning in a clear and tangible way. And at the invitation time, there would be conviction and we would see our need to be the examples for others that might not know Jesus Christ. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you again for what our ears have already heard, what our hearts have felt. Lord, as we've sung about the goodness of God, and Lord, you truly are good. The psalmist told us, Lord, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. And Lord, I pray now that as we continue worship, that God, you would just arrest our souls, Heavenly Father. And if there are decisions that need to be made this morning, I pray today would be the glad day. Those decisions would be made. And God, we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your families and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you know he's for you. Amen. He's on your side. Amen. Praise the Lord. I love that song. I love the fact of knowing that he is for me. He is with me. And I, uh, I'll be honest with you, a tear forms in my eye every time I think about your children and their children and their children. And it really kind of drives home what I've been studying this week through Titus 2 is what kind of world are our children and their children and their children going to inherit if God tarries? If the Lord doesn't return, what does it look like for your children and their children and their children and their children? As we get into Titus 2 this morning, I want to continue our series that is entitled The Essentials. The Essentials. You Remember last week we began this series of messages through the book of Titus and we got through chapter 1 uh, last week on Sunday morning and Sunday night. And this is a letter that is considered one of the pastoral epistles. There were uh, those two letters that Paul sent to Timothy. Timothy was the pastor there in Ephesus. And then he sent this letter to Titus who was there in, an play, in a place called Crete. And we talked about last week what the moral climate of Crete was. So, so here's Paul. He leaves Titus 
in Crete. Crete is an absolute basket of immorality. I mean, there is immorality on every corner that you turn there in Crete, a place of sensuality, a place of sinfulness, a place of darkness. And we referred to last week, you may remember, we referred to Crete as the lost Vegas, lost Vegas of the ancient world. They assume that what happened in Crete might just stay in Crete, but we know that's not true because be sure your sins will find you out. Paul left Titus behind, and he gave him some instruction. If you'll remember, in verse 5, he told Titus, he said, Here in Crete, I want you to set things in order. I mean, you talk about a difficult task. Here's a young preacher, Titus, just on the scene. He's being now encouraged through this letter by Paul, and he's instructed by Paul, his mentor, his father of the faith, to get this place, get this church and set it in order. Now, let me give you a quick review. Paul told Timothy, or excuse me, he told Titus in chapter one, he said, listen, you need to designate faithful leaders. And we saw that last week, that the leadership inside the church needed to meet up with some standards that God had set forth in his word. And we talked about those that were going to be in leadership needed to be those that met the qualifications to serve in those roles. Listen, if there's ungodly leadership inside of a church, mark it down. That church will not do very much. One commentator said it this way, everything rises and falls on leadership. If there was uh, going to be a holy and a healthy church body here in Crete, Titus had to appoint godly leaders. So he said, you need to designate faithful leaders, but then you need to deal with some false teachers. You'll remember there were false teachers that were in Crete that were teaching that uh, uh, there needed to be a adherence to the law if you really were going to have eternal life. They wanted to mix grace and the law a little bit, and we know that it's purely by grace. By grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But these Judaizers wanted to combine works with grace. Listen, you can't do anything to earn God's favor. You can't do anything to merit his favor. You can't do anything to deserve his love. The Bible says God is love and he loves you just like you are. He'll save you just like you are. And there were those that were wanting to mix works with grace. And then there were some that said, listen, we're living under grace, man. Let's just live any old way we want to because it doesn't matter because grace covers an abundance of sin. So we'll just keep sinning so that God's grace would be even more abounding. Nothing could be more wrong than these two extremes. And Titus is this young preacher trying to deal with this faction, these factions there in the church of Crete. These false teachers, they're they were destitute in their talk. They were dangerous in their thought, and they were dishonest in what they taught. Listen to what Titus said about them in verse 16. He says, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, unto every good work, reprobate. So Paul tells Titus, look, you got to get some leadership in place. And as you get leadership in place, now we're going to give you some practical lessons on how you should conduct yourself as believers. So if you're here this morning, you would consider yourself a believer in Jesus Christ. You would consider yourself a follower of Christ. You've been washed in the blood of Jesus. You've been saved by God's amazing grace. Hear what we read in Titus 2 should be some encouragement to you. And the title of the message this morning is, I've got a word for you, all of you. Paul tells Titus, you need to tell them all what they need to hear. Young and old, they need to hear the truth. So let's begin reading this morning. If you found your place in the book of Titus, would you stand together as we honor the public reading of God's word? Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, 
that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Heavenly Father, as we dive into this text this morning, Lord, it is practical truth this morning that you give us from your word. And I pray, God, that we wouldn't just chalk this up as another lesson through the book of Titus, but Lord, we would hear and heed what it is you have to say to us this morning. And God, thank you for what we have already seen, and I pray, God, that you would allow me, Lord, to expound the word of God. Hide me, Heavenly Father, behind the cross, that it wouldn't be my words that these folks would hear this morning, but God, it would be a message directly from you. Give me that touch, God, one more time that turns a mere mortal man into a messenger of the Almighty. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Paul is instructing Titus here on what the conduct of a Christian should really be. And he's got a message for all of us, young and old. He has something that he wants to teach each and every one of us. How many of you would agree with this statement? In the culture we are living in today, we are drowning in gender confusion. The lines specific to gender have been blurred in a greater way than they ever have before. We're striving in today's culture to learn what it even means for a man to be masculine. We're striving to understand what it means even for a woman to be feminine. And that is almost looked down upon in society if a man is masculine. And if a female is feminine, that is almost taboo in the society that we live in. Cultural chaos. You say, who's fueling all of that? Well, it's fueled by the media. It's fueled by our educational system. Other places of influence who want to neutralize or even eliminate distinctions and differences that God has wired into human beings. The Bible says God made them male and female. Amen? Amen. Listen, can I just let my hair down for just a second? I don't get it. When schools and universities embrace this kind of stuff, and ladies have been have been trying through Title IX to get equal f- footing on the collegiate playing fields, and now we're going to let guy, people that were born as men play on the women's team? Are you kidding me? Somebody ought to stand up and say, y'all have lost your minds. But we won't do that because we've been conditioned now that if the church stands up and says anything, we get told we're a bunch of holy rollers. We get told we're a bunch of narrow-minded people. And every time I get told I'm a narrow-minded person, I say, listen, I'm going to be narrow-minded. I don't want to be so open-minded that my brain falls out. And that's where we are. We're so open-minded about everything, our brains have fallen out. I mean, we've got craziness happening around us. And listen, Paul told Ty, listen, we're not the first generation to deal with this. All the way back in the days of Titus, man, he's got to help people understand what their role is, what their masculine role is inside the church and inside the home, and what the females and what her role is inside the church and inside the home. And listen, the message you're about to hear, I promise you, is not popular in the culture today. It's probably not even real popular inside the church. Because we've allowed the culture to have a greater influence on the church than the church has on the culture. There's cultural chaos that abounds. That 
cultural chaos was also found there in Crete. And the truth is, as children of God, you and I have been called to be salt and to be light in a world that is dark, in a world that needs to see believers stand up and be counted. So only two points today, and the church said, now each point has three sub-points and three sub-sub-points, but I just got two main points. Number one, I see the mandate from his mentor. The mandate from his mentor. Paul gives Titus, he, he's writing to young Titus here, and he gives him a, a mandate there in verse 1. It says, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. That very first word of chapter 2, but, it contrasts what was happening there in chapter 1. He closed out chapter 1 with those that were false teachers, with those that had unhealthy doctrine, with those that had unsound doctrine. And he's going he's gonna to really contrast the life of a false believer or a false teacher and, and, and their wicked teachings to what the teaching of a true believer and the conduct of a true believer really should be. And Paul challenges Titus as he says, listen, you need to speak sound doctrine, which could be interpreted healthy doctrine. Weirdsby said this. He said, what germs are to the physical body, false teaching is to the spiritual body. And so Titus wants to just stand up and speak the truth. That's what every pastor is mandated to do, is just to stand up and preach the truth and do so with sound doctrine. Because they needed to know sound doctrine because you need to know what you believe so that it will impact how you behave. And the truth is, let's just nail this down from the very beginning. None of us get it right 100% of the time. None of us get it right 100% of the time. We, we, we are sometimes labeled as hypocrites. We're labeled as those who say things with their mouth but don't do things that they should. But listen, every single one of us have missed it. You say, well, I don't like going to church with hypocrites. Well, quit going to Walmart because they go to Walmart too. I told you just let my hair down for a minute, Amen. None of us get it right. We all mess up. And from the, from the pulpit to the pew, listen, none of us get it right 100% of the time. But we should get it right more than we get it wrong. We'll never become sinless, but we should sin less. And the mandate's been given to every one of us to stand and preach and teach truth. Sound doctrine rings true. And that's what Titus has been challenged to give is sound doctrine. And what is, what is sound doctrine, Pastor? Well, it's sound doctrine if it's number one, if it's found in the Scriptures. If Christ is central to that teaching. If it results in consistent good belief and good behavior and promotes spiritual thinking and behaving in ourselves and others. So Titus is told right here, he says, look, Paul says, look, you're going to have to tell them how to behave. You're going to have to tell them how to conduct themselves. You're going to have to tell them how they are to act. So there's the mandate from the mentor. And then secondly, there's the message to the members. There's the message to the members. It's found in verses 2 through 8. It's, it's, it's Titus's message to the church there in Crete. And to be honest with you, it would have been easy for Titus to just look over and neglect the older members of the congregations of Crete. I hear this so many times from young pastors. Man, we just need to reach young people. If, if, if we could just reach young people, we need to just get some young families. But Titus starts with the senior saint. Titus was a young man, and he knew that he needed to get this message to the senior saint because if it, if, it, if it was lodged into the hearts of the senior saint, it could be pushed down to those younger generations. While some families are striving to, or some churches are striving to reach young families, I'd say this. 
Pastor, maybe you're watching today. You're, you're in a church where you're striving to get young families. I'd say just preach to the ones that God's given you. Just give them sound doctrine. Give them the good word of God and let God do the work inside of his church. Listen, some say, some say it this way, that revival starts in the student section. And that may be true. But I would tell you from experience, in the seven and a half years that I've been here as your pastor, while revival may start in the student section, revitalization happens in the senior adult section. If I've had the opportunity to do things here that maybe others have not. It's because our senior saints have just said, Pastor, lead on. And our senior saints here at Mount Pisgah, I would say to you, are the ones who have helped lay a foundation for us as we go forward. Listen, they're the ones that have have sacrificed. They're the ones that have, uh, listen, How how many of you back in the day would have seen a guy stand up here and play that guitar the way Jeremy does? I mean, there was a day in the church that seniors would have fallen out in the floor, right? But here's what I say, man. Play the guitar for Jesus. Beat the bongos for Jesus. Listen, they, they, listen. We, our, our students could be at some nightclub somewhere listening to worldly music, but thank God they're here listening to the goodness of God. Amen? So, so, so I'm never going to finish this. So Paul's got a message to Titus, and he says, listen, you've got to start with the aged men. And we need every generation as a part of the church. And when those generations come together, Senior saints, young folks, and all of us in between, when we come together, that's when we will have a holy, healthy, happy church. So number one, listen to the word for the aged men. For the aged men. Titus begins by speaking to these older men, and they were not to be put on the shelf to do nothing. They were not to be set aside. He always demonstrates the value of older members. And I'd say this, that our aged men here in this congregation have been some of my greatest encouragers. And what Titus is doing here is he's contrasting their behavior with the false and the mouthy false prophets from chapter 1. And here's what he says to these older men. Look at verse 2. He says that the aged men be sober, grave, Temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. Titus encourages these older men to pursue a different path than what the culture would tell you to pursue. One that is consistent with sound doctrine. Number one, they were to be sober. The aged men be sober. In the days of Titus, the men would sometimes carry too long over the cup. And I've made my position very clear on this. I don't want there to be any question about where your pastor stands on this. I am an absolute teetotaler. That means I don't touch it. That means I don't want to be anywhere around it. That means I am not putting alcohol on my lips. You say, Pastor, that's a matter of wisdom. Yes, it is. And so the wisest thing to do is to just leave it alone. I know that ain't popular. Listen, I told you this wasn't a popular message. Scripture says it... Bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. And so he tells these older men, listen, these younger guys are watching you. And if they're watching how you behave and they walk in the same path that you're walking in, live a life that would, that would not be a life that you would become dependent upon other things. They were to be sober. They were to be serious. The Bible says they were to be grave. That means dignified, worthy of respect. I mean, you see these older men that are with wisdom. They walk with dignity. They have a life that has been a life of learning. And now they have wisdom. Listen, when, 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 when I go into a deacon's meeting and 
I've got some of those gray-haired men sitting around with me, and they say, hey, Pastor, I don't think I'd do that. I normally listen, normally. Sometimes I mess it up still. But you know what they're doing? They're shedding their wisdom to a younger man. Because those men that have had some life experience and walk in dignity, they can sometimes speak wisdom to us younger guys that sometimes get a little out over our skis. And we can learn from their wisdom. This is a man that is honor of worthy, or he's worthy of honor and respect. John MacArthur said it this way, aged men should have the discernment and the discretion and the judgment that comes from walking with God for many years. They control their physical passions, they reject worldly standards, and they resist worldly attraction. They are to be sober. They are to be serious. But these aged men are to be sound. The Bible says right there, sound in faith, in charity, and in patience. Finally, Paul deals with what, what should be a natural outgrowth of walking with Christ. Listen, if you've got a faith that's rooted in a daily walk with the Lord, people know it, and you will automatically have an impact on those that are around you. And the, the man that is sound in his faith, the man that is sound in his doctrine, he knows what he believes, he knows why he believes it, and he knows in whom he believes. And the aged man would say this, even when I cannot trace his hand, I can always touch and trust his heart. So he has a word to the aged men. Hey, men, some of you senior saints, you know, we never want to believe we are the senior saints. I mean, I'm, I'm still young. I, I'm not even getting close to being a senior. And people that are seniors don't want to believe they're seniors. I'm finding that out. But let's just say for us men, I say this to the students all the time. There are people watching you. And that rings true to the senior men as well. There are young men my age, younger, that are watching these folks that have Need for Grecian formula, right? I got, we got some gray hair. What are they watching in your life? What are they seeing in you? And that's what Titus is trying to say. Listen, if we're going to have a healthy and a holy church, you man of wisdom, you need to walk in wisdom. And then you need to, in turn, teach the younger men how they are to conduct themselves. He has a word to the aged men. Secondly, he has an, uh, a word to the aged maidens. So the older women of the church were given some practical ways that they could demonstrate godliness in their life. Several years ago, Elizabeth Elliot wrote a book called Watts, W-O-T-T-S. And it stands for Women of Titus II. And she asks, where are the women of Titus 2? And you'll see, first of all, in verse 3, there is a word about godliness. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. You see, there's a word to the aged men, but there's a word to the aged maidens. Our senior ladies, your life should be a life marked with character. When I think about godly senior ladies, my mind, I, I know I'm biased, I know I am, my mind immediately runs to my mother. I, my mother was a godly, godly lady that had such an impact on me and, to, and, and my family. And, and I hope your children and your children's children and their children would say the same about you. It should be a life that is marked with holiness and with character. Reflecting the God that you love. As we walk through these verses about the word to the aged maidens, I think you'll see a glimpse of a Proverbs 31 woman in these words. 
There's a word about godliness. There's a word about gossip. Watch this. The aged women that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers is what the scripture says. Godly women should speak truth and not slander. Godly women would not make false and unfounded accusations against others, even in the form of a prayer request. Are y'all awake out there? I, I, I hear this sometimes. Uh, there's something going on inside of a family. There's something going on, and they'll say, hey, sister, I want to pray for you. Well, well, thank you. Listen, will you tell me what's going on so that I really know how to pray? I mean, I want to pray a specific prayer. You know, preacher says specific prayers get specific answers. So what I want to do, will you tell me what's going on so that I can pray specifically? You ain't going to believe what's going on. You won't believe what they told me. Did you see what she put on Facebook? I knew something was going on. I told her I was going to pray for her, and we do need to pray for her. Y'all act like this don't ever happen. I've been in a Baptist church my whole life. And it ain't just the women. I heard about eight women go, yep, that's right, that's right, that's right. Almost, listen to this statement. I know it's a strong statement. Almost nothing can harm a church like someone with a long tongue. It is one of the most destructive forces inside of a church. And this is interesting to me. The Greek word here that is used when it talks about not being a false accuser. Who is the accuser of the brethren? That word there in Titus chapter 2 is translated diablos, which is where we get the English word devil. It's the same Greek word, and it's used to reference Satan himself 34 times in the New Testament. So, so, so we should not be about the devil's business. And how can we be about the devil's business? By running our mouth about everything we don't know about. Well, that ain't real popular. Maybe we'll find something that'll stick here in a minute. But a godly woman has control has a governor, if you will, on her tongue. She understands that the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. She understands that is absolutely false. But when the aged woman speaks, that is a woman of godliness and character, she should speak the truth in love. There's a word about godliness. There's a word about gossip. There's a word about goodness. Verse 3, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women. A woman of God is not enslaved to something that would dominate her and that would ultimately control her life. And just like the aged men, she is to teach the younger women issues of marriage, childbearing, along with biblical and spiritual mentorship. Listen, what an awesome piece of practical advice for every single one of us. So let me challenge our aged men and our aged ladies. You say, how old is that? Well, if you're here, you, you match that because somebody's looking up to you regardless of your age. Would your life be a life that would be worthy of someone conducting themselves after the pattern that you have set forth. Let me ask it this way. If they followed in your footsteps, would Mount Pisgah be a healthier church than it is today? If the young ones that were watching your life and followed after your example, would Mount Pisgah be a holier church than it is today? You see what? Paul's trying to get across to Titus is we must conduct ourselves worthy of our calling and we must have character that is above reproach. So let me ask you a question. Are you investing in anybody? Are you investing in anybody? 
Is there anybody's life you're trying to impact that's watching you? There's a word to the aged men. There's a word to the aged maidens. Now he's got a word for the young. He's got a word for the adolescent maidens. Look at verse 4. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to your own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. There's a word to the adolescent maidens. And the first thing that these older maidens are to teach the younger is that they are to be faithful at home. You see, cultural pressures have robbed many, many women of the joy of homemaking and motherhood. Now, let me just lay this out. I know that the next three minutes is not popular. I know it. I'm just going to tell you what the scriptures say. I'm not here to win a popularity contest. I'm just here to tell you what the Bible says, all right? So I'm not asking you to forgive me because I'm just going to give you what the Bible says, but I'm asking you to just hear the Word of God. The feminist movement in this country has made promises that it could not keep. We've rejected in this culture and in this country God-ordained roles. And our rejecting of those God-ordained roles have wreaked havoc on our families and on our churches. The Proverbs 31 woman understood the balance that must exist in the life of a woman. Titus says she's to be discreet. That means to be sober-minded, to practice self-control, chaste, to be pure of mind and pure of heart, keepers at home. Now, this doesn't suggest that her home is to be a prison where she has to be kept. But, but, the, but the idea here is caring for the home and, and, and guiding the home. Good being interpreted kind right there. She doesn't rule over her house with an iron fist, but she practices the law of kindness. They're to be faithful to their homes. Secondly, they're to be faithful to their husbands. And you, 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 you get around some older saints. You get around some of those in their 70s and 80s and early 90s that are still married. And you hear about some of the difficult days they went through in life and, and, and they, 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 they held it all together. We living in a day today that if I don't like the way you dress this afternoon, I'm going to get me an attorney. Hey, it, it, it's my generation and the one behind me that hadn't learned from some of these older senior saints. See, I told you this one going to be popular, but it's just true. We, we, we'll find any reason in the world to get out. I better, I'm going to find some fertile ground here in a minute. The older ladies, those aged maidens, were to teach their younger ladies that their love for their husband should be evident in the home. And let me say this to you fellas. If we'll love her the way we've been commanded to love her, then there won't be any issue about whose role and who's going to do what. You'll be, you'll be doing everything. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. If we'll love our wife the way we've been instructed to love our wife, all this works out. Notice the why of all of this. Notice the why of all of this. Look at the last part of verse 5. That the word of God be not blasphemed. 
That's a great motive for cooperation. That's a great motive for godliness inside the home. And listen, the family has been under attack for years and years and years and years. And listen, I think it's been a coordinated attack by Satan because God instituted the family before he ever instituted the church. And if he could destroy the family, he could destroy the church. And I'm here to tell you, he's having a field day with families these days because we just don't understand the godly roles that God has put us in. Hey, dad, be the spiritual leader of your home. That's what you've been called to be. Be the leader of your home. And and I I heard a a, a preacher, C.T. Townsend, he said this this past week that we got a generation of guys who are staring at a video game all night and, and, and have no idea how to pray for their family. Hey, guys, if we'll take the responsibility of being the spiritual leader of our home, I promise you, you won't have to worry about her being in her place. If you love her like Christ loved the church, I promise you, your wife will love you like you never, ever, ever imagined. It's your responsibility to step up and be the spiritual leader of your home. The family's in a wreck, and we can say, well... Women being in the workplace has been part of it, and I don't disagree with that. But I'm going to tell you the greatest part of it is daddy hadn't done what daddy's supposed to do at the house. And it's wreaked havoc on our families. Gender roles, man, you know what they are today? Old-fashioned. A man being a man is just old-fashioned today. Why is that old-fashioned? A woman being a woman today is just old-fashioned. Some of y'all looking at me like I got four heads, but I'm just telling you. Gender roles have been confused in this country, and it's created chaos. He's got a word for the aged men for the aged maidens, for the adolescent maidens, and then he goes to the adolescent men. In verses 6 through 8, he says that the older men are to teach these younger men what a pattern of good works should look like. One article said it this way. He said, what a real man needs is another man to talk to and to reinforce his maleness and help him better understand how to be a man and how to be a better husband. Without such a friend, men risk everything to the mother-child relationship with the spouse. And then men become dependent, helpless, and they revert to being overgrown kids that need to be mothered. And the lady said, oh, don't say nothing. He's sitting right beside you. Young men, there's two things we should be. We should be moldable. We should be teachable. And when a godly man with a little bit of life experience comes along beside you and puts his arms around you to try to share some godly wisdom with you, you ought to hear it and you ought to heed it. That's the biblical way. There should be a pattern of works. There should be purity of words. You see, integrity comes from a vessel that has sound speech. And hypocrisy in your speech and in your conduct will ruin your influence for Christ. The implications of these verses are astounding. I, I understand. I get it. I do. We're living in 2021, and this just don't get it done anymore. I beg the differ. This word never changes. This word is profitable. This word is as valuable today as it has ever been. And so let's follow the advice of Paul to Titus and find a way to have a healthy, happy, holy church. And where does that begin? It begins by you men taking the rightful role in your place in the home and in the church and then teaching younger men how to find their rightful place in the home and in the church. How does it happen, pastor? 
It happens by some of you ladies taking your rightful place in the church and in the home, walking in conduct that would be considered Christ-like, and then it's in turn teaching these younger folks how they then can walk with the Lord. The invitation is simple. Somebody's watching your life. What are they seeing? Secondly, are you intentionally investing in anybody? Could be today there's some men. You need to find a spot in an altar and say, Lord, would you give me a young man that I can pour my life into? Would you put a young man in front of me that I can make a difference in his life for the cause of Christ? Some of you ladies ought to find a spot in an altar and say, Lord, would you give me an opportunity to invest in somebody coming along behind me that they might know Jesus in a greater way. Young man, young lady, maybe you need to find a spot in an altar and say, Lord, would you give me a senior saint that would pour out their wisdom and their godliness of life that I might learn from their life? That's how you have a healthy and a holy church. As you stand to your feet, let me say this to you. If you're here today, you watch people go through those baptismal waters and you don't really understand what that's all about. I want you to hear loud and clear that Jesus loves you. Jesus came to this world, died on an old rugged cross that you might have life with him everlasting. You see, when Adam sinned, sin nature was passed on to you and to me and we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, because you and I deserve death, but he came that we might have life. And so today, if you don't know heaven as your final home, you come forward, put your hand in mine and say, Pastor, I need to be saved. I'd love to take the Bible and show you how you can leave today knowing heaven is your final home. Hey, men, let's find a spot, an altar, and ask God to give us somebody to pour our life into. Hey, young folks, let's ask God to give us somebody that we could watch their life and conduct ourselves like godly believers. Hey, ladies, young ladies, older ladies, let's follow the pattern of the Word of God. You obey as we sing. Just